What's up? What's up? What's up, y'all? Joy Womack, founder and CEO of Goody Nation, and you are in for an absolute treat. Once again, we are joined by some amazing individuals that are going to break down angel investing. So think of this as it's like angel investing one on one, particularly around the opportunity to invest in Atlanta's top diverse led startups. Um, super excited for the conversation. So not going to spend a ton of time kind of getting into the uh, into into everything, but we're going to do some quick introductions. I'll come back with some logistics and then we'll get kind of right into it. So this uh, this panel, this amazing session is really produced by two of our amazing fellows here at Goody Nation. Uh, I want to bring them to the stage for a quick introduction. Rashawn, I want to kick it over to you before we go to before we go to Jewel. No, absolutely. Can y'all hear me? Yep. All right, perfect. Hi, everyone. Uh, Ray Sean Palou, originally from Savannah, Georgia. I've been living in Atlanta for about seven years now. So I'm a partner with 1888 Ventures, as well as being an investor relations fellow with Goody Nation. Hello, everyone. My name is Jewel Walker. I am Goody Nation's um, Atlanta ecosystem community builder here and helping build strong relationships and also putting on some amazing events here in the community. Pleasure to be here. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Okay, so here's how it's gonna go, right? First, you're gonna hear from two veteran angel investors in Atlanta. They set the tone, they set the culture for the community that we see today as it relates to tech and innovation, right? After that, we're gonna go into a panel talking about the, the basics, the one-on-one, -on -one, the opportunity around angel investing. Um, not all these folks are based in Atlanta, but they know their stuff. And then we're gonna talk a little bit about the ATL as well, right? And so a few things. One, follow us at Goody Nation. Drop your your, your questions, your comments uh, in chat, no matter where you're, you're watching this on YouTube or LinkedIn or Twitter or Facebook or wherever, drop those comments in, we'll get to them. You can also email our team at info at goodynation.org if you want to get, kind of get plugged in. And at the end, we'll have a little bit of call to action for you to join our Goody Nation community. OK, so let's get right into it. Super excited to have our first guest come to the stage. A guy that's influenced to me, serves as a uh, kind of a pseudo mentor, so to speak, someone I, I look up to a ton, whether he knows it or not. I want to bring to the stage Mike Ross to discuss one, you know, first your origin story, then I have a follow up question around, you know, why uh, investing, particularly at the angel level, is important for uh, for for Atlanta and, and for the community. But first, Mike, let's get into a little bit of your your background, your origin story. How'd you get started, um, really in business, but also how'd you get into to, to investing? Well, uh, actually, those are two different things. One, um, I've been in business uh, over thirty years. Uh, the name of my company is MHR International. We are a management consulting company that does program management, construction management, information technology, and diverse business programs, and uh, started over 30 years ago and have managed uh, several major projects in the Atlanta and St. Louis area, including the 1996 Olympics, uh, the Hartsfield Jackson Airport Development Program and the uh, Fulton County Capital Improvement Program. So that's really my day job is construction management, program manager. Um, as it relates to technology, I, um, I always tell this when I'm around young people. I'm probably one of the few people in the room that remember when Atlanta only had SOS band and brick uh, as musical <laughs> groups. And um, then Cameo came and left. And then LA and Babyface came here and the music industry took off and I didn't make no money. And then Tyler Perry and Will Packer came here and the film industry took off and I didn't make no money off of that either. <laughs> so I was really trying to figure out what was going to be next. And I thought it was going to be tech and black tech in Atlanta, because as most people know, we're the leaders in a lot of different um, business oriented things going back to Mena Jackson. And so I, I settled on, on tech, particularly blacks in tech and started 
you know, writing checks. And if you write checks, people will find you. And so I had the pleasure of investing in several individuals, including Jew Burke Solomon, uh, Barry Gibbons, Paul Judge, Ryan Wilson, Candace Mitchell Harris, and Rodney Sanson, all of whom are major, major players, not only here in Atlanta in the black tech ecosystem here, but in the tech ecosystem all over the country. And so it's been a pure joy uh, for me, and I've enjoyed every minute of it. I love it. I love it. I wish I knew you when I had my start. I was looking. I was looking for some angel investors and stuff like that. But uh, no, that's awesome. So, so what do you think the impact though is? Like, like why are angel investors so important for, um, you know, local startup communities, particularly those uh, that are diverse? I mean, because people need money and they need, you know, like a bridge between friends and family and other forms of capital. And a lot of times that's what the angel investor does. They might be a part of a friends and family round or they might come right after it and they provide kind of bridge financing while the founder is kind of figuring out um, what their business model is and how to execute and how to make money. Um, an angel investor or a group of angel investors uh, could, could step in and and provide you know that kind of financing for that particular early moment in the uh, the development of a business. Uh, excellent point. I, I think you know. In, in addition to that, I would love your thoughts on maybe the longer term impact as well, right? So you, you threw out some 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 amazing names: Julberg, Solomon, Rodney, Paul, Barry, Candice. Um, you know, they've all gone on to do just amazing things, right? So I feel like you know, getting in early, helping just talented people to become successful also has a longer term impact on the on the larger community, because now these folks are going on to invest in other people as well. No doubt about it. And, and that's that's what you're looking for. You, you know, I come from a family that always emphasized giving back to the community. So part of this was part of my ministry um, and and being able to invest in in those people who have gone on to do phenomenal things, um, really in the community and all over the country, is a true blessing. That's awesome. That's all. I mean, of one, uh, thank thank you for all the contributions you've made to the Atlanta community. You're you're a true icon. Um, you're a true icon. We could we could have a whole hour long segment on you, and I might have to hit you back up to do that. Um, sure. But I want to I want to uh, bring up another legendary angel investor here in Atlanta. Uh, or investor just really overall to the stage and, and SIG. And so SIG, SIG, quick uh, quick introduction and, 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 you know, backstory for you as well. Well, SIG Mosley, I'm currently managing partner of Mosley Ventures, an early fleet venture fund here in Atlanta. I got my invest, my background in investing began back in 1990 when I was involved in the sale of a local computer software company. And basically my job got eliminated, but I went to work for the chairman of the company, a gentleman by the name of John Emloy. And basically he wanted to give back to the entrepreneurial community which had been very good to MSA. So we began doing angel investing. And I like to say we began it before it, or even known what it was. So for 20 years, we did angel investing, did 122 deals. We made money. We were lucky. And then I have gotten into the venture business and raised $31 million and made 23 more deals. And I have continued to do some of my own angel investing over the whole period. That's amazing. That's amazing. <laughs> what between what you said and, 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 and what Mike said, I mean, you talk about angel investing and their 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 impact uh, on, again on the founders, but think about the impact on the community, like like truly angels. Um, not good stuff. Good stuff. I mean, so so what what then do you think is the what is the true impact, or why why are angel investors so important for for local startup communities? Well, I think Mike covered it very well because you know in order for companies to build. 
they got to get fluoridated. And in order to get fluoridated, they, most of them, particularly technology companies, need some funding. So you have friends and family, but the venture money doesn't come into layer, and generally you cannot get enough friends and family money to get you to the VC. So Angel play a very important part in funding that gap in between the time that friends and family get involved and the time that you can get a VC involved. And, you know, I'm a big believer in angels helping entrepreneur learn how to be an entrepreneur, how to grow a business, and giving them an education that will help them deal with the venture capitalists when they get ready. Yeah, I mean, I, I think again, I think you're you're widely considered the the godfather of of angel investing here here in Atlanta. Um, I mean, I think there's so many other questions we we could ask, right? But you know, was if you think back to the history of of investing here in the city, um, was there a certain like moment or, or, or a few years? Was it like ninety five to two thousand? Was it the early two thousands? The late two thousands, any any moment that really sticks out to you in terms of like like a big jump happened? Well, yeah, because if you remember in nineteen ninety four, that when we had the internet, that actually got opened up to commercial and to the individuals, and so from ninety four to about two thousand, you had a tremendous boom, and young companies began out. You had a boom in angel investing because you also had people who got in made money very early and then became angels so you had an increase in number of angels and then unfortunately in 2000 and 2001 you had the dot-com bus and a number of angels disappeared because they lost all their money that they had invested because so many companies did not make it through the bus. And, you know, and those of us who were here and who continue, you know, we continue to invest every year. Now, we did not invest as much money in the 2000, 2001, and two, but we did invest. We continue to work with the companies that were doing okay and who survived. And it was important for angels to be there to be the backbone for the entrepreneur to lean on. Mm. Man, I feel I feel like you could have just you know taken some dates and uh, <laughs> kind of put another like two two in front of them, like 2000 to 2020, 2022 or something like that. 23. <laughs> nah, good stuff, good stuff. So again, sick. We could we could do this all day. I, I could do this all day. I, I mean, I, we've already asked you a little bit of your time. I feel like we should ask you back and do a whole hour, two hour segment on you all's origin stories. But again, you know, if no one. I, no one else has said it. We, we truly appreciate both you and Mike for your contributions to the Atlanta, um, you know, startup community, tech community, angel investing or in, investing community as well. So okay. truly appreciate you all. Um, OK, so, you know, let's get a little bit. Let, let's go back. So we heard from the legends. Right. You talked a little bit about their their backstory, the origin story. Um, they talked about the impact on startup communities. Let's let's talk a little bit about the one on one the one-on-one, so to speak, around angel investing. So we have some amazing people here uh, and I want to get right into it. So let's do some quick intros before we get into a series of questions. First, I want to kick it over to Don, then Stanley and, and Charles uh, for this conversation. For, I'm really, I'm sorry, for, for, for introduction, of course. <laughs> yeah, thank, thanks, Joey. I could sit here all day listening to Mike and Sig as well. Yeah, I love this conversation. Um, Don Bass here from Detroit, Michigan. I am the director of Growth Capital at TechTown Detroit, which is an entrepreneurial hub in the city of Detroit that supports um, a startup, the startup community and small businesses. I'm also the co-founder of Community Angels. Glad to be here. Hi, everyone. I'm Stan Leonyimba, a vice president at Capital G. Capital G is Alphabet's independent growth fund. And I'm also an angel investor and syndicate lead, so very excited to be a part of this panel. Hey everyone, uh, Charles Robinson here, uh, founder and managing partner at 1888 Ventures, also an angel and syndicate lead. Um, and also I want to just say uh, uh, 
Sig and Mike both definitely are OG. So I'm grateful for their contributions um, outside of Atlanta and in Atlanta as well. Exactly. Exactly. OK, so so let's get let's get into some of these basics. Right. So Don, I want to kick it to you first. Right. For those watching out there, probably a lot of professionals working at big companies, little companies, work for the government, work for schools. Let's define for a second what angel investors are and then also some of the requirements that that they have. Yeah, um, absolutely. My pleasure. Um, so angel investor in just simple terms is someone who invests their own money into you know, early startup companies, you know, or companies. So um, that's the simplest definition. I do think we want to make sure people understand the difference between accredited investor and angel investor. So all angel investors may or may not be accredited. I'm particularly thankful to the crowdfunding legislation, which opened up angel investing to more people. Um, they had to look at, you know, the Securities and Exchange Commission looked at who was included and who was excluded. So the intent of that particular um, legislation, which happened in about September 2020-ish, uh, was to allow more people to invest. And there are rules around crowdfunding and investing, you know, based upon um, income. Um, but a credit investor, which you often hear when you hear about angel investors, is someone who makes $200,000 a year in income for the past two years if they're filing single, or $300,000 for the past two years if they're filing joint, and they expect to make that in the coming years reasonably. Um, or, and these are ORs, and it's important to understand they're ORs and not ANDs, or yeah. they have more than one million of one, one, one million more um, in their net worth, not including their personal residence. Yeah. And the third OR is if they have a certain certification that's deemed as sophistication by the Securities and Exchange Commission. Those certifications, there are three right now, the Series 7, the Series 65, and the Series 82. Mm. So you I mean so okay, so if you have those those type of certifications, you're you're good to go for to be an accredited investor. Yeah, there, there's still some conversations around that depending on states. You know, we've been pushing a lot. Some some states say you must be associated with the financial institution. Um, some do not. So that's still out, you know, out for conversation. Gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. But from also from an income perspective, two hundred thousand dollars individual, three hundred thousand. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I guess uh, with a spouse mm -hmm. or something. And so, so, so again, so the reason why we're doing this is for people that already kind of fit either one of the, the criteria laid out or are on the pathway to doing it. And we know that mm -hmm. in many cases you're employed and, you know, you, that next promotion can got to get you there. Right. So, you know, while you're thinking about what's next in your career and things of that nature, these are the type of opportunities available to you. Um, okay. So, so next up, I want Charles, I want to kick it to you, right? Let's talk about check sizes, maybe equity. You know, many people are used to maybe investing in stocks, maybe real estate and stuff like that. Um, in, in your and in, in also after Charles, anybody else can can hop in. Stanley, if you want to hop in too, maybe next. You know, wh what have you seen in terms of how much um, angel investors typically invest in a, <clears throat> in a startup company, and then how much you know equity do they receive in return typically? or a range yeah sure um so and i would love to you know have stan speak on this because he's he's obviously a, a close friend but he's been doing this um successfully for a long time so um definitely feel free to, to add on but i've definitely seen you know whether you're on platforms such as angel list or the syndicating deals through what they call sp uh, special purpose vehicles spbs for short um you can invest from ranges to you know, five hundred dollars, a thousand dollars, two thousand dollars, and up. I've seen uh, people syndicate things up to uh, seven hundred and fifty thousand, uh, a million dollars. Um, it really goes to how many people do they want on their SPV in regards to um, the amount that they write. So it really ranges. Um, typically, uh, depends on what stage of investment. Um, the companies are in um, in regards to the equity range, but that's typically what I've seen. I pass it over to Stanley. Yeah, I, I would say that there's there's probably not a standard check size. Uh, the one call out here is that angel investors typically invest or should invest only what they're willing to completely lose, because it is a very high risk 
um, investment activity and you, you can lose all of your money and you can make a lot of money. So the, the check size is really dependent on your personal net worth and, and ability to stomach a potential loss. So to Charles's point, you know, you can invest as little as $500 if you're going through a platform or, you know, if you are a high and ultra high net worth individual, you might be writing checks that are a million dollars plus. It really yeah. just depends on your personal situation. And then we, we can talk about what the different um, valuations might be depending on the stage. And, and then that will determine the percentage ownership. Uh, but it, it really does vary greatly. Oh, that's, that, that's almost like a 201, 201 question. We may, we may not have, have a chance to get into valuations and stuff like that. Maybe we can the concept, right? Maybe we can introduce the concept. But, so here, here's the thing. Like, I, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, Joey, I wanted to just add one more thing to that. It is important. You know, we talked about the different size checks is that you do look at their diversification. You know, so if you can stomach 750, um, we would recommend you put 750 in one company because the portfolio is going to be key. This is a numbers game. We know we're going to lose money, but we also know if we build out a portfolio, we have a, a better chance of you know getting a win. Nice, nice, nice. I Here's another thing that I, I've noticed over the years, right? Particularly like like some of my friends and stuff like that that I that I'm pretty sure you know you know they don't never ask anybody you know how much money they got, but you know I'm pretty sure they qualify. They're 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 almost there, right? And so, but I, I see I see that, and they're all super sophisticated people, MBAs, all working for some of the best companies in the world. You know, they'll go take a vacation. You see the photos on Instagram. They've probably spent ten twenty thousand dollars on you know on this vacation. They're, they're stunting on the grand, right? And I'm like. Hey, there's a few startups over here that are really cool. Jewelberg, Solomon, and somebody else, Barry, you know, um, why don't you invest? Nah, 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 nah. I don't know nothing about that, right? So I, I feel as if, you know, if folks can drop five, ten thousand $10,000 on a vacation, you could give up one of those vacations a year to be an angel investor, right? So that's that's kind of how I look at it. Yeah. Sacrifice a little bit, but also to, to, to your point earlier, you know, got to be one to lose it, All right? So, so. Can people write five ten thousand dollar checks to be an angel investor? Is that decently common? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think uh, the, the big piece is that um, I was on, on top of being able to lose the parts that I can understand why they wouldn't be willing to write checks is the due diligence process. Like, oh. if you don't know how to underwrite a deal, and what I mean by underwrite is being able to see the qualifications of the company qualifications of the market, the size of the market, um, the likelihood of success. Essentially, you want to try and mitigate as much risk as possible because it's already risky. You already have to go into it understanding that you're po uh, potentially going to lose everything. But that being said, if you have someone um, that you can, you know, coattail invest with. So an example of uh, going back to what Stanley was saying, you know, being a syndicator or myself or Don, and you know, through our track record, the type of companies that we've invested in and they have won, you typically have an opportunity to kind of follow through what their due diligence process is. And that's where I think the access to the network piece where, Joy, you could say, hey, man, like, go ahead and write a $5,000 check. Here's someone in my network who typically has done really good deals based off of their track record. You're more than likely going to be a winner than not, but you still are going to have some form of risk. So I think anyone can really jump into it if they uh, fall within that criteria that Don was mentioning. It's just more so finding the access to the network of people. And this is what I love what you guys are doing at Goody Nation, Joey, is because you're providing people the opportunity to connect with folks like Don, Stanley, myself, Sig, et cetera, and, and Mike, where they can plug in that. If they don't have that, they have to find um, folks with track record that they can trust to invest with them. You're right. You're right. So let, let, let's do this. Say someone's they're watching right now. Oh, I qualify to become an angel investor or credit investor. I'll, I'll be there in a year. Let me start making some moves now. What type of company should I invest in? Right. I hear the word startups been thrown out all, you know, all the time. Is it, is it the next, you know, Google, you know, Amazon, Meta, software based, scalable, or is it my homeboy that does accounting around the corner, right? Or the mom and pop or someone that has, you know, 
a uh, a soap line, some kind of consumer product. Like, and so, um, Donna, I want to kick it to you and your thoughts on the different types of companies, perhaps that may be better suited to receive angel investment. Yeah, that that's a great question. The one thing I always remember people about is angel investing is not philanthropy. <laughs> they do expect to make money, and usually the rule of thumb is ten x. Now we all know again, you know, we're gonna lose money, but they're looking at it from a lens of how do I make ten x, ten times my money? So it has to be a scalable company. I think that's the most um, important part. Uh, what is you know that market potential? Can they scale and return the money plus some? So then you start looking through that lens and looking at, go back to what Charles said, looking at your due diligence, looking at scalability, looking at management, you know, can this particular management take it there um, in order for you to start making the, you know, those, um, those uh, decisions. What we do find, no matter what type of company, we believe every company is a tech company, you know, mm -hmm. or whether, you know, they, and, or they infuse with some type of technology to get that scalability. If you're on the corner of Maine and Maine, um, it would be more difficult for you to get certain levels of scalability. Um, so, so I think those are some of the important uh, or key points. No, I love it. I love. It. I mean, I mean, you, you touched on me at the end of the day. They got to make money, right? And Stanley, I want to actually come to you and talk about exits, right? So, at the end of the day, to Don's point, it's not it's not philanthropy, right? They got to be able to re the, the entrepreneur has to be able to return the money. Well, ideally, return the money to, to the investor. Um, what are you, you know, kind of a, a, a softball question, but typically how are you, how do you see the entrepreneurs return money to their investor? Is it IPO? Is it sell? Is it, is, is it what? Yeah. So exits can, can take any number of different shapes and sizes. I would say the two most common successful exits are IPOing an initial public offering where they list on a public exchange and raise additional capital from the open market or an acquisition, right? So they may be acquired by a larger player in the space, but then there are also alternative routes for achieving some kind of liquidity event in the secondaries market. So let's say, you know, they've raised money in the past and they're looking to provide liquidity to earlier investors, angel investors or seed stage VC funds that need to return money to their own LPs they can offer secondary shares either from founders or from employees within the company. So there are a few different ways that you can get money back. But you know, to your point, the, the, the purpose of angel investing is to generate additional capital and you only get your money back when there's an exit event. I love it. I love it. Yeah. Hitting on some stuff. I believe the, the secondary, the, the alternatives, 201s, the 301s type of stuff. I think maybe, maybe do a little series, talk about case studies and all kind of stuff where maybe some I, there have been some some famous cases in the news and over the years or I think entrepreneurs, the public feel that the startup has failed, but maybe the earlier investors actually made money. Another discussion for another day. Um, OK, OK. So so now we understand, you know, the different ways to to invest. Right. Accredited investors, you can do equity crowdfunding, um, the types of companies that may be a little bit better fit a little bit of a better fit to return money to investors kind of been alluded to uh, maybe some of those that are more scalable in nature, but it doesn't have to be right. Uh, actually, Char, actually, I want to double down. Are there, um, it, and here's the reason why oftentimes we see diverse founders are, are diverse in terms of the type of companies that they create. That doesn't have to always be software or, or super scalable, they're doing physical products. Maybe they're doing physical locations. And, and sometimes those are, they could be right for angel investment as well. I mean, you know, what's your experience or, or thoughts on the different types of companies that, uh, that should be getting investment? Yeah. And I think that actually brings a, a good point that, you know, a lot of times because of social media and what we typically seeing like Shark Tank and TV shows, everyone thinks that their business is venture backable or everyone thinks that their business is investment ready. And the reality is it's OK just to have a business that's a lifestyle business. It's OK to have a business that um, hits a certain uh, level of economics without having to raise capital, because I want to touch on a point that Don mentioned. The rule of thumb is if you're ready to take investment, you have to think about that. If I receive one hundred thousand dollars, can I turn this into a million dollars? and return that back. That's a 10 X return. So typically what, you know, I see when it comes to companies who are venture backable or investment ready is one, the market size. 
Uh, t the total addressable market is, is usually uh, some of the things that we look at. The TAM is, is uh, the term. But that market size is very important because if the market size is too small, the reality is you're not going to capture 100 percent of everyone. Nobody can say that they're going to do that. It's very rare. And I don't think I've ever seen that happen. But that being said, if the market size is too small, based off of what you receive from the investors, you may not be able to capture enough of the market to either double the money or return the money back to your investors. And that's the big piece I think comes into play when you're looking at your own company uh, uh, being investment ready. The other piece is kind of plugging into networks, um, accelerators, things like that. And I know, Joel, you wrote an article about that, and, and I 100 percent agree with you in, in regards to um, the number of accelerators companies should be able to go into. Because at a certain point, um, if you can't get to the point where you can be investment ready and scalable, you have to decide, all right, I'm going to stop. And I'm just going to make sure I hit this amount of revenue and we just scale to that roof. And that's our ceiling. And then just stop. And you will be successful. And you can find ways to sell your company in those events because they're brokers, just like real estate, to be able to sell your company. But it may not be at the scale that you're typically used to that you've been seeing on television. But that is the most common. Nice. 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 OK, we only have so much more time. This is going to be a multi-part series. I can feel it. I can feel it. OK, so. um Don, I'm gonna start with you in terms of like where can people get started, right? Okay, I'm super inspired. I I I I already qualified to be an angel investor, or I'm about to go, you know, onto a, a equity crowdfunding platform or something like that. I have a good sense of I understand. Okay, it's risky, right? Same thing, it's risky. I'm gonna lose this this money. Um, now we need to find a founder. Now we need to find a startup. What are some things? that people can do? Should they join angel investing groups? Should they go to demo days, uh, their newsletters, things they can follow on Twitter or what? It could be all of the above. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, so I have the pleasure of also um, managing a program where we're training angel investors in the Great Lakes region. I think it cannot be underestimated or under um, um, stress the importance of some level of education, you know, some level of understanding all the things you just said, the fundamentals of angel investing, you know, um, the risk involved, how do you build portfolio, due diligence, all of those are key pieces. And there are resources such as the Angel Capital Association. I happen to be a board member um, of that organization as well. But they have Angel University. So that is, you know, that is one of those type of resources. So as it, once you have the awareness, Education is another key piece. Then you really want to engage in the ecosystem. You can do that many ways. There are places where you can be mentors to um, you know, startups so you get that hands-on opportunity. There are organizations like yours where people can you know, connect so they can understand. Angel investing is a team sport to me. Um, it's good to be in a room with other angels because you get a chance to leverage those skill sets, you know, leverage their network, leverage their deal flow, leverage due diligence, because all of those things take time. And you want to make sure that you're around uh, folks who also understand that. There are angel groups, there are angel networks, there are angel funds, those are different structures. So just understanding how you want to engage, how you want to invest, and find places that you can, um, that you can um, invest with or invest alongside with or le and learn through that process. Oh, man, we're coming up on time. Next I'll, oh, I'm just going to add one one other thing. You know, in Atlanta specifically, you have the Atlanta Tech Angels. You have Goody Nation, who has an angel group. There are a lot of groups as well where you can plug in with investors who can kind of guide you through the due diligence process. There it is. There it is. Now, plug, in, plug yeah. in two more resources here. Black VC. It's BLCK VC. It's a nonprofit organization founded by and for Black angel investors, scouts, and venture capitalists. They have a number of courses, programs, communities that prepare you to become a successful angel investor or venture scout or venture capitalist professionally, if that's what you're looking to do. And then in terms of books, there are a number of, of great books that can teach you about the startup ecosystem, like The Lean Startup, and then Venture Deals, How to Be Smarter Than Your Lawyer and Venture Capitalist by Brad Feld. Um, that's a very helpful book that I read early on. I love it. I love it. Just Charles, quickly, we got like one, maybe two minutes. Um, we want to close with this before we do some just, uh, you know, final, how can people get in contact with you uh, uh, messaging? But Atlanta, 
Like, what's the opportunity? If we get this angel investing thing right in Atlanta, what is the opportunity for Atlanta's diverse startup? Like, what is the impact there? Yeah, I think it, I consider it three areas. So one, you have the corporates. Um, there are a lot of corporations that are coming to Atlanta from Coca-Cola to Home Depot to Invesco, et cetera. Um, that's just going to bring in more talent. Um, you're going to get uh, very smart individ individuals at enterprise levels. So that's one. Two is the universities, Georgia Tech, Morehouse, um, uh, Clark Atlanta, just to name a few. There are plenty more. Uh, you have access to very smart, young uh, individuals who are solving the world's problems innovatively. And then the last place, uh, the, the last piece is the collaborative ecosystem that Atlanta has. Uh, Atlanta has been known to be the type of people who are disruptors, but also willing to collaborate with you. And I think we're getting more and more cohesive um, as we grow and learn more about each other in the different areas that we're placed in. So Atlanta has a lot of upside in regards to uh, the investment community, specifically on the angel side, but even more as more corporates and outside money comes in. I love it. I love it. And how can people get in contact with you, Charles? Um, on Twitter, you can just follow me on 1888 Ventures. You'll see that in under my name uh, at 181888 Ventures. Um, you can just hit me up there. Um, Stanley, what about you? LinkedIn is a, the best place to reach out to me. Uh, it's just Stanley Onyimba. Nice, nice. And Dawn? Same LinkedIn, Dawn Bats. Okay. Awesome, 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 awesome. Well, thank you all a ton. Um, this has been a, been a treat. Again, this is like one-on-one. I feel like we need another session of one-on-one. Then we get a two-on-one and, and three-on-one. Um, one, I want to thank um, Dawn, Stanley, Charles. I also want to thank Mike and Sig from earlier, um, really on behalf of of Ray Sean and, and Jewel and the rest of the Goody Nation family. It's been an amazing conversation, but let's talk about next steps, right? Let's talk about next steps. So we, we hope you came away with this, with a little bit of a better understanding of how to be an angel investor and what it takes, right? This is just a little snippet, essentially 45 minutes, right? Um, if you'd like to join the Goody Nation network, if you already are a, a, an accredited investor, um, you can you can go to goodynation.org, click on the investor network. You can apply there if you're. But if you're not, you just want to simply want to join it and start giving advice to startups, being around startups. You can apply to be a coach in our community, and that'll kind of get you plugged in there. We always recommend people to start get, get connected to startup founders before maybe they invest and stuff like that. So we'd love to do another session on this. But but thanks for for tuning in. Follow us at Goody Nation. Um, on, on Good Nation, all social media channels, but more importantly, the amazing people that you saw up here earlier, one, Google them, um, do a little bit of research on their background and follow them. Trust me, follow them. They are leaders in this space. So thanks again, everyone. Um, we'll, we'll close with Outwork yesterday and stay magnetic. Peace out, y'all.